Good morning. Uh, allow me, I'm, I'm not going to, uh, to I, I'm trying to be brief. Uh, let me just thank uh, Dr. Bahman and Sarah Flanders and Donna Nasur and Eva for uh, their efforts to uh, uh, reflect the reality and what is going on and happening in, uh, in uh, the Syrian fight against terrorism. And uh, uh, allow me to introduce Dr. Bahman Azad. Dr. Bahman is the, in the organizational or the organizational secretary of U.S. Peace Council, and he is a member of coordinating committee of Hands of Syria Coalition. I will leave the stage to uh, Dr. Bahman to introduce uh, uh, the uh, uh, other members. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mazer. Um, thank you for allowing us again to have a talk with you about the, the misconceptions that are going on uh, about Syria and the war that's happening. Uh, since our last uh, pr press conference here in August, uh, there has been a lot of developments both in Syria and here in the peace movement in the United States. Um, our delegation, Peace Council delegation to Syria, um, started a campaign of information and uh, educational process in, in the United States in different cities. Um, we faced a huge uh, amount of uh, backlash in terms of uh, accusations, but we have overcome that. But because of that uh, backlash, um, a few of us in the peace movement, including uh, U.S. Peace Council, United National Anti-War Coalition, International Action Center, and Vice President of Veterans for Peace decided that uh, it's time for us to call, pull our forces together and uh, create a front that uh, would confront the misconceptions and lies that are going on about Syria. Uh, after two, two months of discussion, a statement of points of unity was drafted and sent to all peace organizations, not only in the United States, but around the world and it was immediately well received by more than 250 organizations uh, globally and more than 500 uh, individual peace activists and prominent peace leaders, um, as well as about 1,500 individuals from all over the world. We have a whole list of different countries that have joined and are committed to fighting for peace in Syria and an end to the policy of regime change. Uh, we are now campaigning uh, to have uh, speakers uh, throughout the United States, and for that reason we have invited our dear friend Eva Bartlett, an independent journalist who has spent a lot of time in Syria and Aleppo, and actually she just came back from Aleppo, to um, make a speaking tour throughout the United States. We had the first one on August 2nd in New York. Uh, last night we had our second one in, in New Haven, I'm sorry, Newark, New Jersey at the People's Organization for Progress uh, uh, event. Um, on Saturday, um, Eva is going to be in New Haven, Connecticut. After that, uh, on Monday in Denver. Uh, after that, on Tuesday, uh, the 13th in, in Denver. Uh, I'm sorry, Monday, Detroit, Tuesday, Denver, and from there she would fly to California for several cities uh, presentations, including San Francisco, Oakland, and other cities. Uh, we are very happy that we have been able to organize uh, these, these events because we think that the Syrian situation is very critical, and a lot of lies and, and misconceptions are going on that need to be clarified. With me, uh, one thing before I introduce the panelists, I would like to mention that we have been, uh, we are very happy that uh, Congressman Tulsi Gabbard has introduced an, a bill to U.S. Congress yesterday um, titled uh, End Funding, Stop Funding Terrorism, uh, which involves, uh, which requires, calls for an end to U.S. funding of the terrorist organizations that are now attacking, uh, attacking Syria. Um, our panelists will discuss this thing and other issues with you. Uh, let me introduce next uh, Sarah Flanders, the co-director of International Action Center and a member of coordinating committee of the Hands Off Coalition. Thank you. It's an honor to be here today 
and speaking for the Hands Off Syria Coalition. Just to say on my own previous trips to Syria, the most difficult thing is to come back to the United States with a message on the role of the U.S. war and the way in which the United States has instigated um, through many criminal alliances this war on Syria, this effort to completely destroy Syria. And so the formation of the Hands Off Syria coalition is a huge step forward in building a common understanding within the political movement uh, in the United States of the causes of the war, the reason for the war, and the way toward peace. We're especially honored that Eva Bartlett, uh, a Canadian journalist, and today so appropriate with uh, what's the developments in the General Assembly that a Canadian journalist is here to respond. Uh, the Hands Off Syria Coalition is a continuing effort to develop this basic political unity and an understanding of the massively destructive war in Syria and the way forward. And as uh, Dr. Bauman was explaining, the 10 city tour is another step. The thousands of signers of this statement and the hundreds of organizations in the United States and internationally have signed on to what is called an urgent message for peace on the eve of wider war. And they have endorsed points of unity that I'll just raise briefly. The statement opens by focusing on the U.S. role. It says, we raise our voices against the violence of war and the enormous pressure of war propaganda. The lies and hidden agendas that are used to justify this war and every past U.S. war. We commit to working together to help achieve four very basic demands. One, an immediate end to the U.S. policy of forced regime change in Syria, including respect for the independence and territorial integrity of Syria. Two, an immediate end to all foreign aggression against Syria. Three, an immediate end to all military, financial, logistical, and intelligence support by the United States, NATO, and their regional allies to all foreign mercenaries and extremists in the Middle East region. And four, an immediate end to the economic sanctions against Syria. This policy, the statement goes on to say that this policy of regime change in Syria is illegal and is a clear violation of the United Nations Charter, the letter and spirit of international law, and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, a very important thing to remember on the very eve of Human Rights Day. But the most important point of this unity, the hundreds of organizations who've signed, the thousands of individual signers, is a statement, and coming from here in the United States, an important reminder, that it's not our business to support or oppose President Assad or the Syrian government. Only the Syrian people have a right to decide the legitimacy of their government. Only the people of Syria have the inalienable right to choose their leaders and determine the character of their government free from foreign intervention. So with that, we go forward uh, both in the tours, in the visibility, in the petitions, in the statements calling for unity, calling for peace, and calling for the right of the Syrian people to their own government free of foreign intervention. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, I would like to introduce to you Dr. Donna Nassar, uh, who was a member of the U.S. Peace Council delegation to Syria. She is an attorney and professor at Berkeley College. Thank you, Bauman. Um, thank you. It's an honor to be here once again to remind everyone about the things that we saw when we were on the delegation to Syria last August. Um, I. I, uh, again, had the honor to be part of that delegation, and um, we had the opportunity to meet with not only government officials, but NGOs, um, students, academics, religious leaders, civil society, business people, and we did have an opportunity to meet with President Assad <laughs> for almost two hours during that delegation. Uh, we came away 
understanding that what's happening in Syria is criminal. Um, I came back here as an American feeling uh, disturbed and ashamed of what my government is doing and continues to do. We are heading a coalition of governments who is, whose intent is to s make the Syrian people suffer and remove their duly elected president. Uh, Syria is a sovereign nation. We have no right to do this. And we promised the Syrian people that we met with when we were there that we would come back and speak truth. And that is what the U.S. Um, uh, Peace Council is doing through these talks. Uh, and, you know, clearly, I think at this point, most people understand that uh, it is not the civil war that we are being told. Uh, in the media, it is a proxy war. There are foreigners and people who are being paid and supported militarily, financially, to create the discourse and the suffering that we have been seeing in Aleppo and other places. It was clear to us from the meetings that we had that most of the Syrian people support Assad. And in fact, we didn't, in all of our meetings, we didn't come across anyone who who wasn't in support of Assad. There were people who were maybe critical of some things, but not everyone is unified. And um, regardless of religion, area where you live, regardless of any divisions that we in the United States like to, um, uh, like to use, labels we like to use to divide people, people in Syria are Syrians first. And they support Assad. They are looking to him to continue to lead the Syrian Arab army, to take back whatever places uh, have been uh, destroyed or stolen from them by foreigners. While he's doing this, he continues to provide free education, medical treatment to Syrian citizens. He is working hard to preserve the infrastructure. And he's also, with his government, maintaining and understanding that Reconciliation has to start now. It can't wait until after. And so there is a minister of reconciliation, and they're engaging in restorative justice techniques to make sure that the foundation for a peaceful future for Syria is beginning now. As as the um, uh, uh, as as the militants are laying down their weapons, they're being embraced back into society. That's something that's sort of foreign to U.S. citizens because we reject people like that. But Syrians understand that they must do what's right now to preserve their society and to look toward the future. Um, I'm not going to talk about all the sanctions. I know that Abel will be bringing up some of that. But I mean, we did see and speak with people. We talked to people knowing that the sanctions are causing deaths. It's causing suffering of the Syrian people. And the sanctions are illegal. So at this point, uh, I'm going to end by just saying that uh, we are, um, I am strongly in support uh, of a continuation of what has been happening, what we've been seeing in Aleppo, getting rid of all of the foreign mercenaries, the terrorists who have been destroying and, and harming the Syrian people. It is time that we allow the Syrian people to begin their healing, to rebuild, and give them some time to figure out where they go from here. And I thank you very much for listening. Uh, thank you very much, Donna. <clears throat> now I turn the floor to our actually main speaker, our guest uh, of honor, actually, uh, for our speaking tour in the United States. Uh, we have the opportunity to have her present uh, her experiences and her um, information with the rest of the uh, world, actually. Thank you, Donna, uh, Eva. Thank you. Um, thanks very much. I'd like to touch on something that Sarah Flounders mentioned, which is that uh, today in the General Assembly, the representative of my country, Canada, is raising or has raised a resolution which is not about human rights. It's not about uh, the people of Syria. It's a resolution meant to point fingers and to vilify the governments of Syria and Russia. And this resolution relates to a UN Security Council resolution that was vetoed by Russia and China some days ago. That resolution pertained to another useless ceasefire in Syria, which would have no bearing on, uh, no bring no good to the people of Syria, and which follows um, a week of liberation of areas of Aleppo, which now amounts to about 95% or 95 of areas of Aleppo that have been occupied for years by terrorist factions. So at this time, when 100,000 civilians in these areas occupied for years by terrorist factions have been liberated, 
the UN, uh, parties in the UN wanted to impose another ceasefire. And I, I want to remind people why these ceasefires are indeed pointless. The last ceasefire in September was from the very um, start negated by 20 main terrorist factions who declared they were not going to participate and from the very beginning violated the ceasefire over 300 times during the duration of the ceasefire. And not only these terrorist factions, while the Syrians and while the Russians um, adhered to the tenets of the ceasefire, but the American-led coalition itself violated the ceasefire by targeting Syrian army positions in Deir ez-Zor, killing at least 83 Syrian soldiers in a prolonged attack that lasted nearly one hour and which enabled ISIS to, over, to overtake that position. So this is one reason why a ceasefire is pointless at this point in time. There is no faith that any of the parties that the US and Western leaders who uh, have funded these terrorists, there's no faith that they can actually control the terrorists and get them to adhere to a ceasefire. And the people of Aleppo want Aleppo to be completely freed. And I speak having been to Aleppo four times, and this is the will of people in Aleppo. Um, so on that note, I'd just like to talk about um, briefly, I've been to Syria six times since 2014, two of which were with um, international delegations and four times were independently on a visa I applied for, paid for and waited for. Um, my trips have been self-funded or fundraised and I've gone at my own risk and been able to travel freely in the country to areas I wish to travel to. I've been many times to Homs, to Malula, to Latakia, Tartus, um, Siaf, Sueda, and again, Aleppo four times. And I mention these because I think it's important people realize I have, in, wherever I've gone, I've spoken in Arabic to the people I'm speaking with, what uh, Donna, what Sarah have said, the, that the people support their army and government is absolutely true. Whatever you hear in the corporate media is the complete opposite. And on that note, what you hear in the corporate media, and I will name them, BBC, Guardian, New York Times, etc., on Aleppo is also opposite of reality. Aleppo since 2012 has been inhabited by different terrorist factions, among them al-Nusra, among them the so-called Free Syrian Army, which has committed the same heinous acts of terrorism as al-Nusra, as ISIS, as al sham as Nur al-Din al zinki which beheaded a 12-year-old Palestinian child and somehow is still deemed moderate. Um, since 2012, these areas of Aleppo, which have now recently been freed, um, their occupation by these terrorist factions has meant the greater Aleppo, the 1.5 million plus population of greater Aleppo have suffered sieges denying them food and medicine. They've suffered for years a want of electricity and water and they've suffered daily bombardment by these terrorists of mortars, of gas canister bombs which are improvised and made locally, of water heater bombs which are even more powerful and can level um, floors of entire buildings of conventional weapons like grad rockets supplied by the West, and et cetera. Um, as I said, they've suffered these uh, attacks on a daily basis, and even now, because there are still Western-backed terrorists in pockets of Aleppo, there are still mortars and gas canister bombs raining down, and people are still dying in Aleppo. This is another reason why the liberation and securing of these areas is imperative, because that will actually bring peace to Aleppo. Now, um, my colleagues here mentioned uh, the nature of unity in Syria and the fact that Syrians are, see themselves first as Syrian uh, before any sect. This is an important point because our media and the Gulf media has made Syria out to be sectarian, which is something the Syrians themselves have denied. But it's something, it's a tool to make people confused. It's a tool to make people believe that it's Sunnis against Bashar al-Assad, when in fact, bear in mind that Aleppo is overwhelmingly Sunni and is with the government and is with the army and is suffering from the terrorists who declare that they are liberating the city and Syria. Um, other points about Aleppo are um, hospitals in Aleppo have been attacked. I'm sure you've heard in the media that hospitals have been, have been attacked. Well, this media is referring to the pockets of Aleppo that were occupied by terrorists and they have manufactured stories, and I can give you a precise account. In April of this year, there was a hospital called the Al-Quds Hospital, which in a concerted effort, all media said was attacked and targeted and badly damaged by either the Syrians or the Russians. In fact, the Russians had satellite imagery showing that this hospital was in the same shape that it was in in October 2015. No difference, therefore it was not attacked. Months later, the Guardian, which is a prominent British newspaper, newspaper actually said the Al-Quds hospital that it had alleged months prior to be attacked and destroyed was treating victims of so-called chemical weapons attacks. So even the media that is lying is inconsistent in their lies. But there have been hospitals attacked. 
uh, I went to the al Dabit hospital, which is in Aleppo city. It's a maternity hospital. It was attacked on May 3rd and three women were killed. You would think this would be something raised at the UN or by so-called human rights groups, but it was not. Uh, in December 2013, the Kindi hospital was attacked and destroyed. It was the largest and best cancer treatment hospital in the Middle East. It was destroyed by al-Nusra terrorist truck bombings. And in fact, in recent media reports on Aleppo, again alleging Syrian or Russian strikes on hospital, hospitals, Fox News actually had the audacity to use a photo of al-Kindi hospital and allege that this is in eastern areas of Aleppo that, and that this hospital had been attacked by Syrian or Russian strikes. This goes to show how much the media has been lying from the very beginning about Syria and continues to lie. Um, when I went to Aleppo, I spoke with the Aleppo Medical Association. They comprise 4,160 active and registered doctors. More lies in the media have said the last doctor in Aleppo, the last pediatrician in Aleppo. Of these over 4,000 doctors, 800 of them are specialists. Um, so you can see that when the media talks about Aleppo, it's talking about areas that were occupied by terrorists and it's completely negating the suffering and the will of the Syrian people in Greater Aleppo. Um, when I was in Aleppo in, uh, in July, I got a taste of some of the bombings uh, by these terrorist factions. There was an explosion about half a kilometer away at um, Hattat Baghdad, and I don't know how many people were killed that day, but it was close enough that it was a massive plume of smoke. Um, about five minutes later, an explosive bullet fired from an area occupied by terrorists landed about 15 meters away from where I was. If it had hit parked cars, I wouldn't be here speaking. Um, a day later, a good friend of mine, his mother, was killed by one such explosive bullet. So this is just a small taste uh, of what people are suffering on a daily basis. In November, uh, when I was there with a delegation of Western journalists, including from the New York Times, LA Times, BBC, etc., um, on November 3rd, there were a series of attacks throughout the day with grad missiles, um, explosive vehicles, and other uh, explosive bullets and, and snipings. By the end of the day, 18 people, civilians, were murdered, and over 200 were injured, and including critically. Um, we were at the al Razi Hospital, which is one of the main hospitals, and we saw the maimed people pour in. And this was just one day of many of endless days in Aleppo. Um, on November 4th, we were at the Castello Road Humanitarian Crossing. This was a day that was meant to allow the people in eastern areas of Aleppo that were inhabited by terrorists to evacuate. And this was not the first time. On prior occasions, the Syrians and the Russians had opened eight humanitarian corridors to enable people to leave. These were attacked by terrorist factions heavily. Even that day on November 4th, the Castello Road crossing was attacked, twice with mortar shelling when we were there and five times afterwards. Clearly, there has been political will and intent by the Syrian government and its Russian allies to enable civilians to leave, to minimize any sort of loss of human life. Um, clearly, the terrorists that declare themselves liberators of Syria do not want people to leave. They've been holding civilians hostage. And if you're following reports that are not BBC and that are not New York Times, you will see countless testimonies of civilians of the 100 thousand civilians who've been liberated the last week saying thank God for the Syrian Arab army that liberated us and the terrorists were hoarding food they were preventing us from having food this is all documented also documented are that areas in these um, areas occupied by terrorists including a school um, were housing chemicals used to make uh, chemical weapons and you could see also the gas canisters that were used to make ca um, explosive gas canister bombs in fact, even when I was in Leir Amun, we saw a factory in one of the buildings that was used to make gas canister bombs. In Leir Amun, we also saw evidence of the so-called Free Syrian Army that some people say doesn't exist anymore. Um, the 16th Brigades was active there. They had a cell underground, three stories below, that was perfectly intact in spite of aerial bombings above ground. And I make this point because people talk about the destruction in Aleppo as if the physical destruction matters. It's the people that the Syrian government and the Syrian people care about. And the destruction in areas occupied by terrorists occurs because the terrorists are bunkering below ground, come up above ground, fire their bombs on civilian populations, and go back below ground. So um, I just want to address a few other myths. Um, some of the myths that have been about Aleppo and Syria in general have been that the Syrian government and army are starving the population. Again, I refer to testimonies of people, even people I met with in November. I met with a family 
of displaced people from Al Halak, which is north of Bustan Al Pasha, which was an area, both areas occupied by terrorists. At that time, when I met them on November 10th, he told me that they had fled along with about 40 others on no about 20 days prior, and that they had tried twice prior to flee, but they were prevented violently so from doing so by the terrorists that inhabited those areas. Um, this is the case, these are the testimonies coming out of Aleppo now. People saying, we tried to flee, they wouldn't let us, they shot at us. There are also videos showing people who did manage to flee coming under fire in the Syrian army actually protecting them, acting as human shields. So that's to say that what we've been hearing in the corporate media is not depicting an accurate uh, image of what's happening in Aleppo. The corporate media is saying that the Syrian army is attacking people and until today the corporate media is maintaining this, even though the exact opposite is true. Uh, I would ask you to follow the voices of people in Syria who, like my colleagues here said, they want you to speak the truth. They don't, they're tired of lies. They're very, aware, aware, very well aware of the lies that our media is purporting and that our human rights groups are purporting. They want an end to the violence. They don't want this war to continue. They didn't ask for this war. But as uh, my colleagues stressed, Syria is a sovereign nation. It has the right to fight against terrorism. And we know that 101 of 193 UN member states have sent terrorists to Syria to slaughter and destroy. So Syria is fighting a war against terrorism. It's winning in Aleppo. And hopefully, hopefully either the terrorists will accept a deal to be transported out of Aleppo. Hopefully they will participate in the Musalaha, the re reconciliation will lay down their arms, will take the amnesty offered to them by the government and which has been um, taken by thousands of former militants. And hopefully, above all, the U.S. will stop supporting terrorism and stop funding terrorism. And hopefully this new bill will take fire, will, take, uh, will, will be supported, and actually it will be impossible to fund and armed mercenaries from FSA, Ararasham, Nuruddin Azinki, and all the colors in between because they're all the same terrorists. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Eva. Very informative. Thank you very much. Um, now we are open to questions, if there are questions. The gentleman in the back. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I'm Christopher Ronneberg with the Norwegian newspaper Aften Posten. Uh, a question for, um, or two questions for Ms. Bartlett here. Um, as a journalist, I, I'm sure you can appreciate uh, getting other uh, impressions than empirical impressions from the ground. When you talk about the Syrian people and what the Syrian people want, how can you quantify that? Uh, do you have any independent uh, uh, surveys uh, where, where you can actually um, document that? And, and secondly, um, you talk about the corporate media, the Western media, the lies uh, and all of this. Uh, could you explain what you think might be the agenda from us in the uh, Western media and why we should lie, why the uh, international organizations on the ground should lie, why we shouldn't believe all these uh, ac absolutely uh, documentable uh, facts that we see from the ground, these hospitals being bombed, these civilians who are talking about the atrocities that they have been experiencing. Um, how can you justify it? calling all of us liars. Sure. Thank um, you. I mean, there are certainly honest journalists amongst the very um, compromised establishment media. Let's start with your second question. So international organizations on the ground. Tell me which ones are on the ground in Eastern Aleppo. Yeah, OK, I'll tell you, there are none. There are none. These organizations are relying on the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights, which is based in Coventry, UK, and which is one man. They're relying on compromised groups like um, the White Helmets, which let's, let's talk about the White Helmets. The White Helmets were, funded, were founded in 2013 by a British ex-military officer. They have been fa uh, funded to the tune of $100 million by the US, UK, and Europe, and other states. They purport to be rescuing civilians in Eastern Aleppo and Idlib, yet no one in Eastern Aleppo has heard of them. And I say no one, bearing in mind that now 95% of these areas of Eastern Aleppo are liberated. The White Helmets purport to be neutral, yet they can be found um, carrying guns and standing in the dead bodies of Syrian soldiers. 
and uh, their video footage actually contains uh, children that have been recycled in different reports. So you can find a girl named Aya who turns up in a report in month, say, August, and she turns up in the next month in two different locations. So they are not credible. The SOHR is not credible. Unnamed activists are not credible. Once or twice, maybe, but every time, not credible. So your sources on the ground, you don't have them. Um, as for your agenda, not your, but the agenda of some corporate media, it is the agenda of regime change. How can the New York Times, I was reading it this morning, or how can Democracy Now!, which I was reading the other day, maintain until this day that this is a civil war in Syria? How can they maintain until this day that, there were that the protests were unarmed and nonviolent until, say, 2012? That is absolutely not true. How can they maintain that the Syrian government is attacking civilians in Aleppo when every person that's coming out of these areas occupied by terrorists is saying the opposite? So that's with, it, um, your with regards to your question on lying Western media. How do I quantify the support of the Syrian people? The elections. In 2014, the Syrian people held elections. The voter turnout was 88%, including people in Lebanon where I was during the, Le the elections in Lebanon, which were actually ran for two days, extended hours, people walking for kilometers to reach the embassy, including people who flew from their own countries like mine, which has criminally shut the Syrian embassy so that Syrian people have no rights, and including people within Syria who braved a torrent of terrorist mortars and, and missiles on election day. And yet, voter uh, turnout rate was something like 88%, 80, uh, I believe, and, uh, and then the, the election, uh, the results were um, 78, I believe. I, I, might I think Tim Anderson gives you the opposite. Okay, I might get the turnout wrong. So the, the, ter the results. 74 was the participant. 74 participant, 88. 88. Okay, anyway, the point <laughs> being, overwhelmingly, the people support President Assad. That's based on elections, um, based on my own travels. Okay, so it, that's subjective, but as I said, I've traveled around Syria, talk with people of all faiths, all walks of life, and... There are people that want change in the government. We're not pretending they don't want change. Everybody wants change. But in terms of support of the government, the point is they don't see President Assad as the problem. They see the problem as terrorism. They see elements of, 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 of problems in the, the, the system that they have there. But President Assad, they don't see as the problem. They actually overwhelmingly support him. So I'm basing it on their choice in their leader, and I'm basing it on my interactions with people in Syria and Lebanon. Okay, uh, my name is Renzo Cianfanelli of RCS, Corriere della Sera Group from Italy. I have been a few times, you know, in the area. I have been covering wars for the last 20 years. It's true that uh, the first victim of uh, a war is truth. And uh, I have seen this in Chechnya, in Iraq, Sarajevo, and in Syria. Having said that, uh, I have been watching last night the uh, Russian television and news. Now, they are allowing for the fact that uh, the media in Russia are state-controlled, and so they try to massage the truth. But what they say is that uh, Aleppo is about to be liberated. They have been showing pictures of uh, Russians, uh, you know, uh, demining units, uh, clearing the mines, distributing food, and uh, the picture is totally different. Now, I'm not pro-Russian, but I'm just, I live there, and I don't believe that a single line or uh, any second of TV time has been shown in this country, you know, portraying this kind of uh, picture. So I would ask the panel, what do you make out of this? What is the actual truth? I mean, those not only from Russian media, but from Syrian media and from people, even independent people who are in Syria are saying the same things. Let's remember that um, it was thanks to Russian aid, which was welcomed by the Syrian government, that Palmyra was liberated after something like 10 months of occupation. And how was Palmyra occupied? The U.S.-led coalition turned a blind eye as terrorists of ISIS sped through the open desert to um, attack and overtake Palmyra. Uh, when Palmyra was liberated, the Russians went there and were demining. Um, I can speak on just a side note. Um, in other areas that have been either liberated or had the terrorists extracted, for example, the old city of Homs and, and Malula, 
um, I went to both places, one in, uh, two and one months after liberation or extraction of terrorists, and in both cases, before leaving, the terrorists do lay mines um, in houses, on roads, and locals or in, in, uh, in certain areas, um, especially now in Aleppo, the Russians are participating in demining. You, you ask why we aren't seeing this. Um, well, this relates to the other gentleman's question about why the corporate media, some of them, most of them, are telling lies about Syria. It's because this is the agenda. If they had told the truth about Syria from the beginning, we wouldn't see, we wouldn't be here now. We wouldn't have seen so many people killed. Um, in fact, what the Russian media, which may or may not be state controlled, depending which media you're looking at, is saying, it, it shows exactly what the Syrian media is saying, and it shows what independent people in Syria are saying. And I can refer to a young French gentleman who is independent, he's not political, he's humanitarian, he's been living for nine months in Aleppo, experiencing the hell of terrorist bombings, and asking him, you know, is this true? And asking Syrian colleagues in Aleppo, is this true? Yes, it's true. So unfortunately, very unfortunately, um, our media and certain human rights groups like Human Rights Watch, which likes to tweet um, images from Gaza and say it's Aleppo, they're not going to tell the truth about Syria. Thank you. You go ahead. Sure. Uh, Matthew Lee, Inner City Press. Uh, I, I wanted to um, start. Uh, obviously, there's a juggling a lot of things. That the, not only the meeting on Syria and the GA, but there's one on North Korea. So I actually wanted to ask if, if any of you are willing to to compare the, the both the, the the media coverage and sort of UN action on Mosul and, and Iraq and and Aleppo. This is a, both are on the agenda of the Council. And, and if you're all, even if you're able to, the, the way in which both the media and the UN are dealing with the conflict in Yemen, which gets is almost never mentioned here. So, and then you may have said it while I was in transit, but the, the, the role of Saudi Arabia and Qatar in, in, in funding groups, if you, I don't know if, if in the course of your reporting, what you came across on that. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Matt. Sir, you want to respond to this? The corporate media in the U.S. and in the West has a completely a complete bias in their coverage. Uh, and let's just to take the example of Yemen, where it will be described about bombing of Saudi Arabia, but it's never mentioned that Saudi Arabia really has no independent air force. Every, every plane that flies uses U.S. satellite reconnaissance, GPS, is fueled in the air by the U.S. Air Force, uses U.S. military contractors to run the whole operation. Yet it's described <coughs> as a Saudi war uh, against Yemen. And the same thing is true if we look at any area today in the Middle East, that without understanding who is playing an enormous role in orchestrating and coordinating various players in complete destruction of the existing states and a systematic destruction of the sovereignty, and also plays this role within the United Nations as to how to distort the role of the United Nations as to be a force to deny independence and sovereignty to independent countries uh, and to threaten the existence of quite a number of countries. So whether it's in Syria or Iraq or Afghanistan or Libya, uh, and we can see the horror of a U.S. orchestrated bombing and destruction what's called regime change, that's far too polite a word. It's really creating total chaos uh, and pulling down a government and leaving behind a divided ruin. <clears throat> and then taking no credit for it, just leaving it to the blame of contending factions that today are, are controlling Libya. So this is, this is a future that they want for Syria, and this is what the people of Syria are resisting and resisting with enormous uh, determination to hold together as a secular, united, uh, giving, giving space to every religion, culture, and grouping within Syria, 
uh, that's quite an accomplishment. And calling on and gaining assistance from other countries, which Syria, as a sovereign nation, has every right to do. On the other hand, the U.S. and the bombing through the United States and NATO and Saudi Arabia and Israel, who was bombing just yesterday in Syria and has continued to, and Jordan and Turkey and so on, uh, none of this is invited. It is all done in the name of attacking ISIS, and yet there's barely a scratch on ISIS. So there's a complete bias, uh, and it, it is reflected, of course, in the media, a vilification of Syria, of Syria's very right to exist, and a continuing demand for uh, regime change, which really means tearing apart the existing government. And uh, all of these areas very much connected, and, and thank you for making that connection. I just wanted to add, to add a couple of words to this question that relates to also to the role of media. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, uh, one thing uh, that the media tries to present uh, the Syrian situation as is, is, is whether it's a litmus test between those who support President Assad and those who oppose it as if the whole fight is about President Assad. It's not. If we go back to history uh, from the 1990s when the Soviet Union and socialist camp collapsed, a wing of the leadership of the United States was intent on filling the vacuum and becoming the sole global dominant force in the world. And they came up with a lot of, lot of uh, well-established objectives, among them, um, I'm sure people are familiar with the project for the new American century and the rebuilding of American defenses for 21st century that was published by them that became the State, the, the State Department official policy after Bush came to power and other people from project for the new American century became cabinet members and international leaders of the U.S. policy. Uh, it became an official policy. And it, among the factors that they mentioned that the U.S. has to do in order to maintain its absolute dominance over the globe uh, was two things. One, uh, making it impossible for another rival like Soviet Union emerges on the scene, um, which now, according to them, is a potential rival will be China, and the 21st century will be confrontation with China, and reorientation of U.S. forces into toward China. That is one. And secondly, they talk about regionally dismantling, overthrowing, or partitioning dismembering any country that has enough strength to resist U.S. plan for the 21st, 21st century. And they list many of those countries, including the ones that the U.S. is going right now through one by one. Uh, went through Iraq, went through Libya, went through Syria, going through Syria. Probably the next target is going to be Iran and Hezbollah, right? All of them are mentioned in that document. And although Obama uh, presidency apparently did not include all those neocons, it is following the same policy, of course, with a more internationalist view. Bush was very unilateralist in terms of implementation, so it was the United States alone doing this and carrying the lead. Uh, probably Obama wants to do it in a more collective way with NATO. But the objective is still the same, and they're pursuing it. And let us not forget that the pre precondition for making such a thing happen uh, and implementing this general policy requires total support of the media for demonization of the leaders that they want to bring down. And the media has played that role consistently from the beginning. And that's what they're doing. And what Eva was describing and, and Donna was describing and others is testimony to this integral role of the media in this imperialistic project that is going on. And there must be uh, an end put to it. And, and, and this is what we are trying to do as an uh, international uh, organization that is trying uh, to at least get the hands off Syria for now, but we have to continue on, on further on. And we are very happy, once again, I would like to repeat that uh, Congresswoman uh, Gabbard has, has introduced this bill that really puts this on the agenda of ending funding for all terrorist activities that are being supported by the United States. And we call upon the whole world peace movement to really support such a campaign. Eva, you want to add something? Um, on that note, I anything. Mean, well, yeah, I mean, uh, there are some points I didn't address because I did want to leave time for questions. But before, you know, the, the focus, which is now rightfully so on Aleppo, um, a lot of the focus over the years has been on refugees. 
And media hasn't been talking about the internal refugees, which number six million. And this whole um, people are running from President Assad narrative doesn't jive when you consider that. And again, I can I can give you personal anecdotes of meeting many of these refugees that have fled from Aleppo to Latakia because they were fleeing the terrorists the West has sent to them for you know freedom and democracy. Six million internal refugees that are being housed in areas like Latakia, Tartus, Jebele, Damascus, Sueda, uh, refugees coming from all parts of Syria. And this is very important because they've been given housing and their, you know, their children are still being sent to school. They're being given medical care. Um, and the other point I wanted to touch on, which uh, Donna mentioned, what was, and, and Sarah mentioned, what were, are the criminal sanctions? Um, because, you know, the nations that have imposed these sanctions de de claim it's supposedly against the Syrian government. But it is the Syrian people who are suffering. They're suffering from want of basically everything, but particularly medications and equipment in hospitals. So, for example, in hospitals, um, vital life equipment and, you know, scanning machinery, machinery that need technicians or replacement parts are not getting it. And that means the people are not getting the therapy they need and in some cases dying as a result. And the sanctions affect the economy. And the economy is devastated by six years of war on Syria and by the sanctions because now exports are impossible to most nations and imports are impossible by most nations. So the sanctions is something that... Again, if people really cared, because the whole theme about Syria is we care about the people of Syria. So if you really care about the people of Syria, first of all, report truthfully, and second of all, lift the sanctions. I just want to add something about the sanctions. You know, we know they're not getting medicine. We know that um, they're not getting equipment. We know that uh, medical treatment is compromised. But sanctions have another devious uh, result. And that is that when, when uh, businesses close because they can't get the equipment and they can't get the product and they can't, they can't sell, um, they become, people become desperate. And when they become desperate, they're more likely to do desperate things, such as possibly joining the militants because they'll get a paycheck. So we don't often think about that when we think about sanctions, but I think that's a very important point to consider, that sanctions are not just what you see from the outside and the, the medical treatment, but there are other more devious and, and deeper issues that, that uh, manifest because of sanctions. Go ahead, sir. I wanted to add a point also on the sanctions because the sanctions on Syria actually predate the, uh, the war in Syria. The first U.S. sanctions in Syria began 1998, and then onerous sanctions on Syria, 2003, at the time of the U.S. war in Iraq, the invasion, the occupation, uh, and reaching even more extreme forms, of course, in 2011 but really each time meant to create shortages, impede development. Uh, and the other point I wanted to add is just uh, uh, very important that Eva described the centers for the displaced because overwhelmingly the more than six million displaced within Syria are taken care of by the government. And the centers that I saw for the displaced was probably the most impressive thing. That it's not, you know, you could visit so many countries and see the sheer number of children begging on the street, completely destitute, no one taking care. And in Syria, in the midst of war, the displaced are housed in schools, in community centers. It might be a family in each classroom and there in the cafeteria runs a health clinic, and, and there are classes for the children, and there are after-school programs that university students come and run, and mentoring programs. Uh, I had never really seen anything like that in a time of war and have visited other countries in the midst of war. But this effort by the government to in every way not just provide food, but provide for the health, for the healing, of the population, providing psychological counseling and especially providing these mentoring programs for the, for the children. Uh, I was very impressed. I was really moved by 
um, the daycare programs, uh, programs for women to learn skills. Mm -hmm. All of this takes place in the Centers for the Displaced. And it shows why people in Syria, their homes utterly destroyed, driven out and in fear, would turn to the government for help. And a government that under sanctions still provides meals and paychecks and health care. That is what the effort to destroy Syria is all about. And I, I think right here for all of us who, who are fighting in the U.S. for health care and, and for jobs and human needs, we need to uh, look at, in the richest country of the world, the inability here and the determination even under war conditions to provide this mm -hmm. in Syria. Thank you, sir. I guess our time is up. Uh, I would like to thank everybody who came uh, to listen to us and also our panelists for their great contribution. Uh, let's join hand to end all wars and including especially the war on Syria, which is unjustly imposed. Thank you very much. I, I will ask you also to make note of handsoffsyria.net. Well, he's asking, do we have time to answer? Or? Yeah, go ahead. I mean, uh, one thing I'd like to note very briefly is that the United Nations repeatedly efforts to silence the Syrian ambassador when he's speaking about the country in question. So that's one thing. You would think that the country in question would be given a priority, but it's not. Um, on many occasions, Ambassador Jaffray has been silenced uh, by having his video feed cut or his microphone cut. That's one aspect of it. Yeah, the resolutions. I mean, the resolutions, they get ignored. Now, Representative Gabbard has introduced this resolution. There are so many resolutions before um, that make it prohibited to send weapons to terrorists in Syria, and they've all been ignored. 2253 is one of them. There are many before that. Um, so, yeah, the fact that the UN can, imp that can um, these resolutions can be passed but totally ignored, that's another aspect. Thank you very much.